the Sheets Public Library. My name is Liz, uh, and you are here today as part of our No Sustainability series during the month of January, where we're taking a look, inviting experts from our community to come in and share with us um, their knowledge and give us some ideas on how we can live a more sustainable life. At Boundless Farmstead, David and Megan use organic and sustainable practices to grow wholesale and resell vegetables, poultry, and eggs in Central Oregon. Boundless Farmstead was not the plan all along. Born not from heritage, ancestry, or conformity, but from an uncontrollable, rampant, and unbounded desire to do what we learn to be right, to tend the earth, and to leave the world a better place for generations to come. Boundless Farmstead's mission is to grow and cultivate healthy plants, animals, and community, and to form creative and sustainable practices by observing, listening, and studying. So please welcome Megan. Um, let me know if you need me to change the volume at any point. Um, okay. So my name is Megan. Um, I co-own Boundless Farmstead with my husband, David, and my mother-in-law, Abby. Um, I wasn't given an exact outline or direction, uh, kind of just a sustainable farming 101. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Let me know if there's anything you kind of want to talk about in general. Um, my sort of rough outline for today is to introduce you to our farm um, and tell you a little history about David and I and, and local food specifically. Um, and then to kind of discuss what this whole spectrum of sustainable farming is. Um, I'd also love to briefly discuss sort of what the, the importance of local food system um, and local sustainable agriculture. So is there anything else kind of right off the bat that you'd like to hear about? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to start with this photo. It's a photo I took this summer. Um, and I feel like it really exemplifies farming in the high desert. It's sort of this great juxtaposition. So yeah. to, uh, to the west of our farm is sort of the edge of the badlands. It's this wild land, it's scrub land, it's juniper, sagebrush, uh, native plants. Uh, sort of down the fence line, we have this invasive chi grass. Um, and then to the east is our farm. So as you can see, it's, it's non-native plants. It's lush, it's green, it's manicured, and there's water. Um, I really like showing this image because I want everybody to think critically about what sustainability is to you, and also, and also what it is to what it means to have the opportunity to change the landscape so drastically, and sort of the immense power and responsibility I think that this photo demonstrates. So, if we're going to change the landscape so drastically, we need to do it with the utmost care and respect that we can. So this is our farm. Uh, this photo is a few years old. The greenhouse is a little longer now, but um, we are a 20-acre farm on alfalfa. Like I said, right on the sort of like a mile from the Badlands Wilderness. Um, we have 10 acres in diversified vegetables and in cover crop, so we kind of split half and half. Um, about five acres in pasture and hay, uh, and one acre in a new orchard. Um, and then there's a few acres kind of in outbuildings and that sort of thing. So we have, we currently have a 90 member CSA. Um, does everybody know what a CSA is? Or not know, I guess? Okay, so CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Um, it's essentially like a, a weekly food box. I like to think of it sort of as like a loan program. So you as the community uh, give the farmers money up front in the in the winter and the spring when we need to pay for things like seeds, amendments, uh, fix all the stuff that broke the year the, the year past, um, and then we sort of pay you back with interest in vegetables all summer long. So our CSA runs um, so eight between eighteen and twenty weeks in the summer. Um, we also sell to a dozen restaurants. Um, we sell to some small farm stands, Central Oregon Locavore. Um, and we also sell to the Downtown Bend Farmers Market, I guess it's that way, um, and the Prineville Saturday Farmers Market. So, let's see. Um, Liz already said this, but I want to kind of repeat it. Uh, when we first started the business, we sort of came up with this mantra and this mission statement. So 
That was farm said was not the plan all along. Born not from heritage, ancestry, nor conformity, but out of a, but from an uncontrollable, rampant, and unbounded desire to do what we learn to be right, to tend the earth and to leave the world a better place for generations to come. So I just want to say, you know, we weren't, we didn't come from farming families. Um, we both just came to farming out of this desire to do the thing that we thought we could do that could make the best impact, I guess, on the planet. And our mission is to grow and cultivate healthy plants, animals, and community, and to form creative and sustainable practices by observing, listening, and studying. So that's just sort of our approach, I guess, to the farm. Um, just wanted to briefly show you, this is our farm. Uh, Google Earth actually updated this year, conveniently. But as you can see, we're sort of surrounded by very high desert, uh, surrounded by scrubland, Junipers and sage. Um, to the north, there's a few properties, but you can sort of see how the farm is divided up. That's the 10 acres of mixed um, cover crop and uh, diversified vegetables. And I'll come back to this image in a little bit. So I want to give you kind of just a little history about how David and I came to local food. Um, I really like this combination of pictures because it really shows how important food is to us. It's like even when we're not farming, we're cooking or we're foraging or this is kind of all that comes to of our life. Um, so David started out farming in McVinville in 2013, uh, kind of right out of college. He uh, So he's going on about 10 years of farming now. He graduated with a degree in environmental policy. And he sort of saw two directions in his life. One was he was either going to become an environmental lawyer or he's going to become a farmer. So if that tells you anything about him. Um, so he went in the farming direction. Uh, his first year, he had a 30-member CSA that he grew out of his backyard and on leased land, while also simultaneously running a fermented foods business. So needless to say, working 100-hour weeks, he would burn himself out. Um, and he kind of took a year or two off after that to explore other options. He did some commercial fishing and construction, but after that he came back to farming, fully knowing that's what he wanted to do and just realizing he needed to do it a little bit more sustainably for himself. Um, so, and then a little bit about me. So I, I grew up in a sort of poor rural Oregon um, in the foothills of the Western Cascades, um, Marion, I'm not going to be familiar, but down to 500. Um, so my family came to sustainable food, not necessarily out of environmental or ethical reasons, but sort of out of financial necessity. Um, we had neighbors who grew large crops, you know, large fields of crops. And so in our cross street, we had a green bean farm and we would go there and we'd glean and we can green beans for the winter. And we'd be so sick of green beans by the spring, but it was... <laughs> Great um, opportunity to have. Um, my dad hunted for a big game to fill the freezer. We had a small garden just to kind of supplement in fresh vegetables. So after uh, eventually my parents had a little bit more socioeconomic success and we moved and we came to Bend and um, got rid of the garden, got rid of the canning, um, but it always kind of stuck with me. Um, so after graduating from Bend High, I moved to Eugene uh, to pursue a degree in journalism, which I ended, I ended up getting after four years, but uh, quick, quickly got swept up into the local food system. So every paper I wrote was about, was about local food, about farming, about concentrated animal feeding operations. And so all my, all my research was just dedicated to food production. Um, I volunteered at farms, both urban and rural, and had a garden, community garden plot, and was that weird college kid who, instead of having box mac and cheese and frozen pizza, I had dilly beans and frozen tr trout and berries. Um, so after college, I attempted to briefly, I briefly attempted to use my degree, um, but was more interested in being involved in the local food system. So I did everything from working food service to doing culinary tours to um, eventually acting as the assistant director at Central Oregon Local Board. Um, I've also served on multiple boards like the High Desert Food and Farm Alliance Board and the Ben Farmers Market Board. And all that eventually led me to meeting David and, and starting Boundless. So just wanted to kind of go over 
some brief, some challenges that are unique to growing in Central Oregon specifically. Um, so challenge number one is definitely the weather. <laughs> I don't know how long y'all have lived here, but it can be a beast. Um, I would say it's the number one limiting factor to growing in the high desert. We have very sporadic and extreme weather compared to other parts of Oregon, you know, compared to the Willamette Valley. Um, there are no guaranteed frost-free days, um, and we have very large diurnal swings. So it means nighttime temperatures can be uh, radically different than daytime temperatures. Uh, and it, typically, I would say it's around 40 degrees. We've seen swings as high as 15 degrees where we frosted and then had it been 90 degrees that day. Um, plants don't love that. So, <laughs> uh, but we're figuring out which ones do okay with it. Um, we have a, a thermometer outside that sends images to our phone uh, or gives us updates on our phone. And I just sort of took these screenshots, but um, I think the longest growing season or longest frost free days we've had so far has been 65 days and the shortest has been 35 days. Mm -hmm. So last year was a particularly cold spring. As you see, we had 16, I guess, 15 degrees at the end of May. Uh, I think that July ended up being a frost or near frost. Part of our field is about two degrees colder than the other part. So I think it frosted on half the field, not on the other half. Um, I just think that's really interesting. Uh, also with weather, um, hail has, has always been a, a part of living in Central Oregon. Luckily, we've only really had one bad hailstorm at the farm, but um, it can really, you know, it can decimate a plant, but it can also, they can also live and, and it just sets them back a couple of weeks. Um, the image on the left is actually a frost protection measure that we take. So we irrigate for frost protection. It, I don't exactly understand the science, but essentially it, it encapsulates the, the plant in ice and the formation of ice actually produces heat and so we've been able to take plants down to, I think last year was around 16, 15 or 16 degrees and they, they survived. So very effective. Um, something that's really becoming a part of our reality throughout the entire West is um, wildfire and smoke. So to me, this is, this is probably one of the hardest aspects of farming because even though it's smoky, we can't stop working. Um, plants typically keep growing. We still need to make an income. We still go to the farmer's market. Um, it's really challenging uh, to work through the smoke. Um, this picture on the left is a double whammy of a, an early August frost in combination with smoke, which is always my favorite. <laughs> um, we're learning ways, you know, of trying to lower the amount of workload and we try to we give our, our employees the opportunity not to work on those days or to receive hazard pay. So um, yeah, we're just trying to figure out how to navigate something that seems like it's going to become part of our reality. Pests are another um, issue that's not the Central Oregon specific, but everywhere. Um, this is damage caused by porcupine and quail, which is not something I dealt with. Um, I think in our first two years farming, we probably lost around $20,000 in lettuce. So after that happened, we realized we really needed to either not grow lettuce or do something different. Um, so we bought bird netting and that has helped a lot, kind of allows us to coexist with the animals without having to trap or kill um, and also get product. So that's been a nice uh, sort of middle ground. Also pets, of course we have bugs and cabbage loopers and that sort of thing. We also had a healthy crop of uh, pack rats last year in our corn. Um, I'm sure they're even healthier now as corn fed pack rats. They're doing great. <laughs> um, that was a new one for us. Uh, and then predators. I, I wanted to spare you guys the, the graphic pictures of some of the predator issues we've had, but um, we have a lot of coyotes. We have a lot of aerial predators, so red tail hawks and um, great horn owls and that sort of thing. And you know, all these things are like what make this area so beautiful too. So you just kind of have to learn to coexist with them. Um, so we've we've gotten really good at, you know, our, our coops are sealed tight every night. Um, the electric fencing helps. It allows us to move the animals around the pasture more and keeps coyotes out. Um, and aerial predation still happens, but it's not 
It's not a devastating amount. And the big one is water and irrigation. Um, this one has been uh, very prominent in my life in the last year or two. Um, the water laws we have in Oregon are, are very antiquated and are not really current with our, are not, are not um, flexible enough to deal with our current situation. So I could probably talk for two hours about water law. I would not do that to you. Um, if you'd like to talk more about it, I would be happy to. Um, but I do want to mention, so in the in the spring of last year, I wrote a letter to all of our legislators kind of about um, how our water works, how we, how I see, or what issues I see and what possible solutions I see. So if you're interested in reading that letter, I can send it to you. Um, it's also on our website, on our blog, so you can feel free to read it there if you kind of want to learn more. I also highly recommend reading the Upper Deschutes Water Basin Study. I think that's a really great place to start. Um, if you just want to learn about where water goes in Central Oregon, how irrigation works, um, all the different irrigation districts, who gets senior rights, who gets junior rights, it's all very complicated, um, but that document I think helps a lot and it's unbiased, which is also nice. So, how us switch gears into really talking about what sustainable farming is. Um, I know a lot of you are probably here to, to learn about the growing practices and the, and the soil and sort of the hands-on tangible stuff. And that's mostly what I'll talk about, but I also really want to exemplify that sustainable farming is not just about growing because you can be an excellent grower and never sell a thing or you can burn yourself out or um, there's a lot of issues that could happen. So I just kind of want to touch on the end about what it takes to really be sustainable um, in, the, in the full idea. So I think something that all sustainable farmers can agree on is that um, as far as growing practices, that no chemicals are ever used on the land, um, that the farmer uses organic practices or what I like to call like beyond organic practices, um, and that GMOs are not used. So organic practices, um, kind of in a brief nutshell, mean that there's no chemical fertilizers used, no chemical pesticides used, no chemical herbicides used, um, the farm has to practice some degree of crop rotation and that there is uh, some diversity. And then kind of what I like to call like beyond organic practices that I think a lot of small scale sustainable farmers in the area are using are things like cover cropping, um, including things like insectaries, so planting um, things specifically for uh, pollinators and insects. Uh, building soil organic matter, especially in the high desert. Um, where I think our farm started out at about 2.5% organic matter, which is, you know, kind of around 8%, and it's really like getting 1% is really challenging. Um, I think also beyond organic practices, I would include uh, a wide diversity of plants and animals on the farm, uh, as well as potentially using um, some sort of permaculture practices. So, uh, I just wanted to give this little brief example of how a sustainable farm could work or like how a sustainable practice could work. So on the left is our greenhouse. These plants have gone through the entire winter. They're, you know, they're frosted, they're pretty sad. We're about to flip it into spring crops. So we run our chickens through there. Um, and then I think that was about a week later, they completely wow. eaten down all the, all, anything that's green that's left. Um, hopefully eating any aphids that are around or any bad bugs that we don't want. Uh, and then we'll take the greenhouse, we'll spread compost that we make um, along with organic amendments, and then we till and, and lay drip down. So um, this is just like kind of one of the ways that we prep beds. Um, let's see, next up a little bit here. Okay, so. I want to talk a little bit about nutrient uh, organic and sustainable nutrients and amendments. Um, the way I really like to start talking about this is telling people that they should do soil testing. Um, 
<laughs> because you can apply organic um, amendments or fertilizers, and you can still do detriment to the environment. So too much phosphorus or too much potassium, things that don't um, get used up quickly can leach into, into waterways and cause the same sort of like algae blooms and those sorts of things. Um, so even, even using organic methods, you would really want to be um, applying things carefully. Um, so every year we do soil testing. We test all of our greenhouses separately and then we test like four different parts of our field. Gives us sort of an idea of what we need to add. Um, this looks kind of complicated, but um, it just talks about organic matter. So organic matter is now at 3.4% after five years. So we've managed to like bump it up 1%. Um, nitrogen, which, you know, NPK, which you see on the bags a lot of times, where on the fertilizer bags, we'll say like 444. Those are your macronutrients, um, all the micronutrients and that sort of thing. So that really helps us just to gauge how much we need to put in and, and what sort of macro and micronutrients we need to add. Um, so we use, we unfortunately cannot make all the nutrients we need on the farm. We make compost and we run the chickens through, but we still need to add more. So we ordered something called Perfect Blend. It's an organic fertilizer that's basically just baked chicken manure. Uh, they bake it to remove the parasites and that sort of thing. Uh, and we get eight tons delivered. We get a huge smelly pile of chicken manure every year. Um, that we spread on the farm. Um, and then I also kind of wanted to, oh yeah. We also, as far as other um, things that we add, we'll use organic, organically certified feather meal, fish meal, fish bone meal, and then some micronutrients like manganese and zinc, um, boron. Oh yeah, that's what I want to show you. An example of why you really need to be careful about adding organic amendments is, so boron here, is one pound per acre. So one, you know, it's like this much per whole acre. And like, so you have to be very careful about getting that spread out because if you just throw it willy-nilly, you have like some serious toxicity issues. Um, yeah, and then I kind of wanted to show you some of the products that we use that are organic. Um, but I, you know, I want to show you this like full spectrum and, and give you full transparency. So the BT is a organic bioinsecticide. It's the only one we use on the farm. It stands for um, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's essentially a bacteria that if the it only affects certain caterpillars, and if they eat it, it kills them. Essentially, we chose to use this one bioinsecticide because we had. Uh, we probably lost about 30 or 40 percent of our brassica planting to cutworm, which is a moth caterpillar. Um, we like BT because it also doesn't negatively affect anything else. So, you know, like a lizard or a bee or anything else could can consume it and it would be totally fine. Um, we could spray it on kale and eat it. We would be totally fine. Um, that's about the only uh, organic insecticide we use. I know there's things like neem. Or um, what is it that other people use? There's like essential oil blends and stuff, but we don't really like to use those sorts of things. They're they're okay, but um, they can just kill. They can kill bees. They can kill everything. So you have to be really careful even when applying things like essential oils. Um, we use this mycoply. It's a mycorrhizal inoculant. Essentially, it's a fungus that allows the roots of your plants to kind of communicate with everything else that's going on in the soil, like fungus does. Um, and then we really don't like using any chemicals on the farm and in our wash station for food safety reasons, you know, you have to, you have to sanitize and, um, sterilize. And so we use this thing called Sanidate. It's bleach free and it's basically just hydrogen peroxide. Um, and we also use iodine. Those are the two that we've chosen to use. One of the things that I and David that David and I are most proud of, and I think that bring us the most excitement on the farm are the amount of cover cropping and crop rotation that we do. So, drink. I'm gonna go back to this map. I think it's easiest to show you. So, we practice 
a pretty intensive crop rotation, which means that we move our crops from one area of the farm to the next, uh, or to another. And the reason you'd want to do this is it keeps um, pests from building up, keeps diseases from building up. Um, it basically just moves things around and keeps the, you know, keeps the, everything guessing. And also some plants take up more of certain nutrients, so it kind of moves that around as well. So it was 10 acres on top, and we have it split into 20 blocks. So basically half acre blocks. So labeled one through 20. So in a given year, all of the odd blocks, so like one, three, five, seven, will all be in cover crop. And all the even blocks, two, four, six, eight on, are in vegetables and in specific vegetable families. So this year, all of the vegetables were in even blocks. And, and next year, everything moves over one. So what was in cover crop will now be in vegetables, was in vegetables now be in cover crop. So essentially we don't take a cash crop, we only take a cash crop off of a certain area once every two years. Um, this is kind of a lot, you know, in, in conventional or even organic um, systems, this would not be something you do, you know, it's kind of, you wanna maximize your space and use as much land as possible. But for us, it was the, it was the best way we can figure out how to maintain soil health and build organic matter. So, um, so some plant families, for instance, we grow a lot of brassicas, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, because it's really hardy. So we have three brassica blocks. So there's some families that we don't grow very much of, like corn and potatoes, they share a block. So the corn, corn and potatoes will never see the same part of land for 20 years, essentially. Our brassica crop, about, brassica crop rotation is about seven years. Um, so that's really nice as far as, yeah, like I was saying, like disease buildup and that sort of thing. So, what about with the greenhouses? The greenhouses, we, every, on our, on our property outside, we only single crop areas, but the greenhouses are, are such a valuable space that we triple crop. So we put a spring crop in, a summer crop in, and a fall crop in. And so because we use them so heavily, we baby them essentially. So we add a lot more compost, we're adding a lot more amendments. We're just kind of like really trying to care and give the soil a lot more organic matter, compost, that sort of thing. The other stuff, we have the space to sort of let it sit fallow. Um, so that's how we, we choose to sort of uh, navigate this too. Um, so yeah, crop rotation and then cover cropping. So, you know, five acres of our 10 acres is being cover cropped every year. This is Sudan grass. So these, this is our brassica block. It's tilled up because this is in the fall and we're about to plant a, a cover crop in it. But the Sudan grass this year got to be about nine feet tall. Um, it's a great cover crop because it's, it's not frost tolerant. So you have to grow in the summer. But essentially what we do is we, uh, we let it grow, it winter kills, which means it frosts and it just lays over and then it decomposes on top of the soil. So in all of our cover crop blocks, we try to have a uh, spring a spring cover crop, something that's overwintered, like uh, rye or peas. And then we follow up with a summer cover crop. So that's the buckwheat over there mixed in with the Sudan. Uh, and then we either let it lay fallow or we plant another fall cover crop in it to be overwintered again. Um, yeah, does that make sense? That's kind of awful. Sarah? How do you, you, you just mentioned that you make sure that the cover crops, in fact, are there also for pollinators. Mm -hmm. How do you, like, are these standard cover crops or do you use special ones for that? So for we've been on the farm now for, this will be our sixth season, so we've definitely experimented with a lot of different co cover crops. Some are much better in the valley and, and die in the winter. So we finally found like a, a mixture that we love. So um, for pollinators, buckwheat is amazing. The bees love it. Um, that's our summer cover crop. We've also planted things like phacelia, um, which bees love. Um, red clover or crimson clover, both are great. Um, and then always just for fun, we plant a huge stand of sunflowers. <laughs> Um, because they're easy and they're beautiful. Uh, what others? 
are really reliable overwintered cover crops are rye, cereal rye, um, and clover and Austrian winter peas. Um, those are our favorite. The winter peas are great too because you can eat the tendrils and it's kind of a nice spring bonus. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Um, just briefly, we also do a, a bit of pasture-raised chicken. It's not really a huge part of our operation financially, but I really like having animals and I like um, having that kind of extra fertility. So I really like this image. This is where the chickens were. This is where the fence line was. And you can just see like how much nitrogen they've added to the soil in just that spot. Uh, we move them every two to four weeks, uh, kind of depending on how quickly they're going through the the feed. This in the winter, you know, there's not really a lot for them to eat. So they're in, they're in this same space for a little bit. We're gonna try to move them before like uh you know they're uh before it gets like too dirty and so that they have like a nice clean area to live. So the chickens stay around the truck, is that it? Yeah. yeah. We that old truck, well, that old truck I think came from Alaska. Yeah, from when David was a kid. Uh, and then it finally broke down after trying to fix it too many times, and we decided to turn it into a chicken coop. Well, I've uh, heard uh, we have a small <laughs> farm in Hawaii, but uh, chicken tractors, mm -hmm. where you move kind of a cage across the Yeah. Top. Have you done that at all? Yeah, we. so for the laying hens, we use kind of a more uh, station, like that truck or another coop. We also use these for our, um, for our meat chickens. Meat chickens only stay alive for eight weeks. Uh, it's a really fast turnaround, and we use the same sort of setup for our turkeys. And so we move that. I usually move that coop every morning. Um, so I'll move the coop around in the same kind of area every morning, and then I'll move the fence also. Uh, the fence I'll probably move like once a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then sort of last on our sustainable practices are, uh, I would just say, responsible water, water use. So we don't use drip everywhere on the farm. We just use drip in the greenhouses. Um, so, but the first thing we did when we got on the farm was we changed all of the hand lines and all of the wheel lines. So hand lines are kind of like those big metal pipes that run and then the wheel lines are on the wheels and move forward. Uh, we changed all that over to micro overhead sprinklers. So they're really low. Um, they have like a 20 foot diameter and we have them every 20 to 30 feet. And um, it allows us, well, it keeps, first of all, there's not as much of an evaporation. And it also gives us a lot of like really uh, fine control over where we're putting water. It's like on a wheel line, you know, you just get the whole wheel line, you have to water all that. But what David is in charge of irrigation and basically every, um, we change it every eight hours. And once a day he just walks around and he will literally just plunge his hand into the earth, check the moisture, if it's good, he walks to the next block. Um, so it's really nice to be able to not have to feel like we have to overwater or, or we can give the things more water that want it or like, you know, tomatoes can go weeks without water. So um, yeah, it's nice to have that control and to feel like we don't have to use more than we need. With those black lines there, are they just uh, have little holes in the uh, in the water line? Is that it? Uh, sort of. There's um, they're not emitters there. They they're they're internal emitters to help with pressure regulation. So there's a lot of different options you can use on a home scale. There's these things called like soaker hoses that would be yeah. that would make a lot more sense. I think there's also just like the simple um, uh, like holes you're talking about. But because our this is more technical probably than we need to know, but because our system has so many uh, different, because our irrigation system has so many different options on it, we run a certain PSI and everything has its own pressure it needs. So that's why they have their individual pressure regulators in them. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is one part that I was really kind of excited to talk about because I like making people think Critically, not things. Um, so, like anything, sustainable farming is a spectrum, right? So, I kind of came up with this analogy where, um, so, like, for example, I could say, I'm an omnivore, I only eat organic, um, but 
but I don't eat cane sugar, even organic cane sugar. And then you might say that to a vegan who says, you know, I'm a vegan, I only eat organic. I'm okay with organic cane sugar, but I would never eat meat. You know, so you have two people that are kind of like, both think that they're eating as sustainably as they can, but they're sort of in disagree, you know, disagreement or on different ends of the spectrum. So I think that happens with farming also and growing. Um, so I kind of want to talk about these like uh, these things that I think sustainable farmers might not even see eye to eye on. And this is for you to decide. Um, so plastic. This is uh, an image I just stole off the internet. It's single-use plastic mulch. Uh, a lot of organic farmers are using it. It is basically there as a weed barrier so that the farmer can just plant into it and uh, not have to weed. At the end of that growing, that person, that farm has to take the plastic out and either throw it, but you hope you can pull it out in one piece so you can throw it in the dump. So a lot of times what happens is it gets sprayed by the wind and it can blow around. Um, you know, David and I have, this is something that we will never use on our farm. Um, but we also have farmer friends that we have a lot of respect for that use it. And, you know, all that being said too, is like, we hate plastic, but this is our farm. We have a plastic greenhouse. We have row cover, which is a plastic product. We have plastic irrigation. So it's kind of the spectrum of, of trying to do the best you can. Um, you know, but you also have to give them in some some ways. Um, tillage, I think, is another one. So some farms are very into no-till, um, all hand tools, all hand scale. Um, our farm uses tillage. I do think no-till is probably better, um, but tillage is kind of the way we've been able to be financially sustainable. Um, it allows us to grow the most food that we can for our community uh, with the least amount of labor. Um, also, like I mentioned kind of briefly before, but sort of organic approved, organic approved sprays. So I remember hearing this one story um, from a farmer friend of mine who said he went to a farm, an organic farm in Texas and everybody was in hazmat suits because they were spraying like a huge amount of neem oil. And you know, it's a, it's an organic spray, but it still, it was, it was in such large quantities that it became toxic. Um, yeah, so you know, there's there's kind of like responsible use versus overkill. Um, another one that I think comes up a lot for us is uh, petroleum use. So a lot of us got into local sustainable farming because we didn't want the transportation. We didn't want things being shipped in from Mexico. We wanted to sort of take that environmental footprint down. And so we do use a lot of hand tools. Um, a lot of our weeding's done by hand, all of our planting's done by hand. We do a lot of stuff by hand, but we also use a tractor, um, diesel. We tried to get an electric one, but not yet. Um, the, we have a diesel tractor that we do our harvesting into and our tilling. Uh, this is a cultivating tractor, so basically it runs over the beds and helps us weed. Um, you know, and then there's other uses like Eating greenhouses with with propane. That's something that David and I said we won't do, but we also have friends that we respect that do that. So just another side of the spectrum. Um, seeds. Um, there's hybrid seeds versus open pollinated seeds. This one I don't think is debated as much. Hybrid seeds are not GMOs. They're just they're kind of like the mule of seeds, um, combining two different varieties. Um, but open pollinated are sort of these open source seeds that you can save the seed every year. You can't save hybrid seed every year um, because they're like a mule. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's, you know, sort of debated also. And sort of the big one I want to talk about just briefly is certifications. Um, so there's a few different certifications. USDA Organic is government certification. And then these are sort of third party certifications. Um, they, they all have different meanings. Um, you know, having to become an expert in them is all is challenging, especially if you want to be an educated eater. Um, I, David and I have chosen not to certify organic. We grow everything with organic practices, but um, there's kind of a few reasons we've chosen not to certify. One is because we know so much of our 
our, our, we like know all of our customers, you know, we're small enough that we see everybody at the farmer's market. We know our chefs, we know our CSA members. If anybody has any questions, we try to be completely transparent and there, and we invite people out to the farm. Um, I also think it's a little, the, the other certifications are okay. The organic US, the USDA organic certification, I think is a little bit watered down for the reasons, like I said, like being able to like mass spray organic and, and that sort of thing. Um, but they are also great for farms that don't get to know their customers. And they're also great for customers who, who go to the store and have the decision between conventional organic um, to purchase. Um, I still think purchasing organic is always better than purchasing conventional um, in the grocery store because it kind of gives you at least some, uh, you have some knowledge about what the farm is doing. Um, yeah, so I think it's good for faceless transactions, but it's it's just good to be aware of all, of all these certifications and, and kind of what they really mean. And, I, you know, honestly, I think the best thing to do is just to know your farmer and, and ask all the questions you want to ask. So this is kind of the part, let's see, I'll try to wrap up here, but um, this is the sustainability part that I want to talk about that was beyond growing um, and beyond soil and beyond growing practices. So to be, to be a sustainable farm, you have to be sustainable in your business and in your finances. And I think in that, like with the morale and the happiness of your employees, so these are all things that Dave and I think about a lot, you know, probably almost just as much as we think about growing. Um, you have to have a good business plan um, because if your business isn't viable, then it doesn't matter if you can grow food. Um, we also really have a lot of care for our employees. They work really hard. We try to pay them a living wage. Um, and I know that's not always how farm workers are treated in our country. Um, they're probably like the hardest working and least paid people typically. Um, so that's just something to think about when you're purchasing food. Um, I also want to talk about being sustainable in your community. So to me, I think whatever makes our community stronger makes our farm stronger. Um, we like to be, we like to try to make our food as accessible as possible. Um, so for us, that means participating in a lot of different, <coughs> sorry, different programs. <clears throat> so we participate in the Veggie RX program. I haven't talked this long in a while. <laughs> Um, uh, Veggie RX is by High Desert Food and Farm Alliance. Uh, they, it's essentially a vegetable prescription program. So doctors get to prescribe fruits and vegetables to their low income patients who may have a diet related illness. So those are sort of the two factors, low income, diet related illness. And then we provide them with fruits and vegetables for free. And then we get paid through a grant. So it's pretty, I mean, it's awesome. We we still get paid for providing it. They get to access the fruits and vegetables for free and hopefully, you know, help to alleviate or eliminate their diet-related illness. Um, I also uh, thought it was really important to be able to take EBT on the farm. Um, we take food stamps, essentially, and uh, we participate in a program called Devil Up Food Box. So we're able to provide a matching grant to our CSA customers so they can get half off of their CSA um, if they're using food stamps. Uh, we also take farm direct nutrition program vouchers, which are uh, for elderly and WIC mothers, I believe. And we also, you know, just like the giant vegetables, like the Giving Plate and Fent Food Project. Um, this year, we also decided to implement a sliding scale payment option for our CSA. So essentially, uh, there's a website that kind of gives you what the, the income two people would need to make in order to live like a, a modest living in the area that you're at. Um, here it said that number is 60,000. So that's kind of where we set our price. So we're like, if you make that amount, uh, that is like a full price DSA. If you make less than, you can choose to pay less than. If you make more than, you can choose to pay more than. So it's totally voluntary. People don't have to do it if they don't want to. 
We don't screen anybody. It's all um, based on the honor system. Uh, so yeah, I'm really interested to see how that works out. And it'll be, a, it'll, it's an interesting experiment. Uh, kind of lastly, the sustainability thing is David and I, especially as we get older, are learning that we need to be sustainable sort of in our body and mind. <laughs> we, we still work 80 to 100 hour weeks in the summer, um, but we've also, as you know, we've gotten uh, out of our 20s, have been like, all right, we're going to stretch every night. Um, we always, we love food, so cooking a good meal has never been an issue, but that's really important to us. And then, you know, getting outside as often as we can and just kind of doing those things to for our minds that are a little bit outside of farming, um, at least in the off season. Uh, yeah. So, but I've been talking a lot about the food system. I just wanted to kind of show you this graphic really quick. Um, you can take a look at it, but I did this, this graphic just really helps me drive home the importance that eaters have in the food system. So eaters are the people who are, who are driving the practices, who are, are driving the production, because we don't just produce something on our farm because we want to. I mean, occasionally we do, but it's never a good business practice. Um, you know, we, we grow things that we think people are going to eat. So if, if people demanded that food be grown a certain way, then people would have to shift from growing food in a different way to meet that consumer demand. So eaters have more power than I think that they, than they know. Um, yeah, so I just want to kind of end it and talk about how people can support local sustainable farming. Um, one thing is, like I said, so you're driving, you're driving practices, you're driving sustainable food. Um, so making it a habit and not a whim, um, making it so we can, we can plan on you being there and know what you want. Um, knowing that the, the eater will be there if it's a hundred degrees or 40 degrees, um, just sort of, yeah, making it a part of your lifestyle instead of maybe like a, a trend. Um, yeah. And sort of, yeah, I just kind of want to end it with um, just inviting you to really think about what you consider to be sustainable, what you want to see, um, what you think that we with the power to change the landscape should do. 